Situation normal, everything must change. Oscon is moving. We are moving from the land of Kappa Chu 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 Tea <laughs> to a land where everything is so big they only have data. <laughs> we are moving from here to there. But why? That is the fundamental question of strategy. And as a former recovering management consultant, I feel I am in a unique position to help us pivot around that question, refocus our energy, and obliquely synergize our collective thought processes. This translates to, I have no idea why this is happening, so let us pretend it isn't. By unique coincidence, that happens to be the motto of corporate enterprise IT departments <laughs> all over the world. If you look at the diffusion of technology, uh, adoption over time from early adopters to laggards, enterprise IT runs a different sort of path. It has multiple different phases. The appearance of a new technology, we go through the ignore, ignore, ignore phase. <laughs> then as it starts to become popular, we move on to the no, no, I said no, damn it phase. <laughs> and eventually, as everybody has it, we move on to the oh no, oh fudge <laughs> phase. The issue is an issue of situational awareness, which is a subject we suck at. <laughs> Most of us think that boards are like chess-playing masters. In fact, the reality, it's more like alchemy, gut feel, and meme copying. Yay, let's Uberize the economy. <laughs> Surge pricing for funerals. <laughs> Sorry, Norman, you can't afford to bury mother today. You'll have to keep her at the motel. So why do we suck at situational awareness? Well, I'm going to give you two examples um, to explain the issue of situational awareness. One is a thought experiment called Chess World. The other is historical called Thermopylae. So Chess World. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess but no one's ever seen a chessboard. All you've ever seen are these characters on the screen, and you play the game by simply pressing a button. Your opponent sees what you have pressed, they counter, you counter, and the game continues until somebody wins or it is a draw. Now, what will happen is over time, people will grab these games and discover magic sequences within them. If you press knight, I should respond with pawn, pawn, bishop. They'll even write books on the secrets of the king, etc. And then one day you will play a game of chess against somebody who will see something truly magical. They will see the board. You will move a piece, they will counter. You will move a piece, they will counter, and you will lose. <laughs> what the fiddlesticks happen there? I all my big data systems. Nothing saved me. Maybe it's because they pressed the button quickly. Maybe they had a good lunch. Maybe it's because they're a happy person. No, it's because you live in a low-level situational awareness environment. They exist in a high-level situational awareness environment. A second example is Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general. He had a problem. The Persians were invading. He could defend around Athens. He could defend around Thebes but he decided to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into Thermopylae, a narrow pass where a small number of troops could defend against a large force. This is the Battle of the 300. Now, I want you to imagine it's the eve of battle. You are standing there, Themistocles is in front of you, and he says, I do not understand the landscape. I do not understand the environment, but have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> straight, 
Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army. A high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the E4s might stop the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we hate the Spartans. Threats, the Persians get rid of us. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced 2,000 years later. So what do you think is more effective in combat, a map or a SWAT? What do we use in business? Perfect. <laughs> Most businesses use SWATs and secrets of success are based upon backward causality. If A does B and A is successful, we should do B too. They have no positional movement. It has verbal reasoning or storytelling. High-level situational awareness environments are context-specific. You have position and movement. They usually use some form of visual reasoning. So if you ask, why does a general bombard a hill? It's not because 67% of other successful generals bombard hills. It's not because bombing a hill would make a good story. And it's not because that's what Uber would do. We use a map. Maps tell us where we can attack. Why is a relative statement? Why here, over there? And then we're on to the action, the how, the what, and the when. So in military terms, it's all about situational awareness. First, the where, the why, and then you're into action. Unfortunately, in business, we have a tyranny of action. So where are our maps for business? They don't exist. Fortunately, they're re relatively easy to create. You take a box and wire diagram, you turn it into a value chain, start by focusing on the visible user need, then adding the underlying invisible components that are required to meet that need, and this gives you position. But of course, value chains aren't static. The components evolve from genesis to custom built to product and rental services to commodity and utility services. So we need to add that evolution access to give us movement. And this was the first map that I produced 10 years ago, in 2005, of a company that I run, ran one of our lines of business. Now, what I have is position and movement. So what? Well, if I take a project like High Speed Rail, HS2, in the UK, this is how they were trying to organize it with box and wires. Um, part of the railway is being built in a virtual world, first of all, because it's cheaper to, to test out a railway in a virtual world rather than digging up half the countryside. And so they turned it into a map. Now, the good thing about the map is that's the visible user need at the top. But because there are multiple components, we also know those components are evolving, so the map isn't static. And we also know, as the components evolve, their characteristics change. They start off in this uncharted, unexplored world, highly uncertain, chaotic, unpredictable, and eventually they become industrialized, ordered, known, standard, dull, boring. And because we know this, we know there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methodologies. Agile, XP, and Scrum are very good on the left-hand side, particularly when you want to reduce the cost of change. But on the right-hand side, as it's industrialized, you want to reduce the cost of deviation. And Six Sigma is good. Now, in the middle, you're trying to build a product. And so you want to reduce the cost of waste. And this is where lean is particularly strong. So you take a large-scale project, and rather than having a one-size-fits-all, you use multiple different methods. And then what happens is you start taking different maps, like borders, immigration, the National Police Database, and you start combining them together. And you discover, if you aggregate these maps, that you have usually duplication in what we do throughout systems. So everybody is building compute, or everybody's building a website, or everybody's building a workflow system. And we have bias in the system. So some people are using commodity, while others are building or custom building their own computing systems. And by using this, you can remove cost and waste. Now, often people think that governments are where the most 
bureaucratic uh, duplication and waste can be found. Actually, the private sector excels at this. Um, the most examples of duplication I have found in a single company is 380. So this is one large corporate. It has 380 customized versions of the same ERP system doing exactly the same processes for exactly the same types of users around the world. Now, by removing this, you can massively reduce cost. We've seen 60 million pound projects go down to 800,000. 1.6 million go down to 96,000. Of course, once you do this, you can start to apply doctrine. This is known as fast and expensive, simple and tiny. It's from the US Air Force. The US Air Force discovered that people came up with ideas, and on a scale of complexity and goodness, people then added new features to the idea, making it more useful and more good. Then what happened is people added more features to the idea, <laughs> making it highly complex and of no use to anyone. And that's roughly where they built it. So what they wanted to do was break this down into small components, fast and expensive, simple and tiny. So when they built the intelligence agency supercomputer, they applied the process, and they realized the best way of doing this was to go out and buy 1,753 PlayStation 3s and wire them together. Now, unfortunately for Sony, they were pretty upset because these are a uh, lost leader. They're a games delivery vehicle. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, they did buy a game. Uh, <laughs> um, but they also used it for the Harvest Hawk, which went from idea, i.e. paper, to combat operations in 18 months, which for military hardware is pretty exceptional. So when you have a map, what you do is you break it down into small components. Microservices, yay! <laughs> you can even organize around this stuff. So you have small teams, what we call the two pizza model. So no team bigger than can be fed by two pizzas. In my case, that's six. <laughs> yeah. Normally people say 12. Um, but the problem with small cells is you still have this issue that things need to evolve. But we have mechanisms to solve that as well. There's a wonderful book. Uh, Accidental Empires, written in 1993 by Robert Cringley, which talked about the three-party system. And so when you have a map, what you do is you populate it with pioneers, people who are good at exploring the uncharted world. You also populate it with settlers, people who can take the half-working, half-baked idea and turn it into a useful product for others. And you also have town planners, People who can take the product and industrialize it, turn it into a commodity, a utility service. And so you can build a mechanism of theft within a system which mimics evolution. But that's all boring operational stuff. The interesting thing about maps is you can start to play games and you can start to learn what works and what doesn't. So if you have a map, you can start to anticipate change. Back in 2005, we knew compute was going to a utility. We knew platform was going to a utility. You can manipulate a map. You can use good things like open processes, open source, open data, open APIs to drive things to more of a commodity. You can use evil things like patents and FUD to slow the process down. Now, when you have a map, you can see where you can attack. And why is now a relative statement? Why should we attack this space over another? And that is how you turn business into situational awareness first and then action after. And of course, once you do this, you realize that business is nothing more than a game. It is a game which has maps. It is a game which has repeatable patterns, 61 different forms we know about. It's a game which also has monsters. This, by the way, is the Aliax, one of the most frightening monsters in Dungeons and & Dragons, and I mention it because it, is, it was created by our very own Pythonista, Alex Martelli. Woo, where are you, Alex? 
So, what does the corporate monster look like? Well, most of them don't have maps, so they sit in the dark telling stories to each other. We'll get back at that Amazon with social media and our new gadget, <laughs> etc. They keep on yo-yoing between different methods. Let's be agile, let's be Six Sigma. They outsource vastly too much, completely unaware that the industrialized components will be efficiently treated because they don't change, but they'll always get hammered by excessive change control costs in the uncharted space. They suffer from backward causality. Let's be like Uber, let's be like Amazon, surge pricing for the win. They suffer from duplication, bias, lack of anticipation, and the department of no. Most of them are an accident waiting to happen. So what about the future? Well, one of the interesting things is that things evolve from product to commodity and utilities, and when they do, they cause an explosion of higher order systems, new wonder. But they also cause the death of past companies stuck behind inertia barriers. And this particular pattern, known as peace, war, and wonder, is actually identifiable through weak signal detection. And so you can actually see when these points of change are likely to occur. And it's happening today in cloud, infrastructure, platform, and it's starting to happen in big data. We're shifting from a world of products to a world of utility. But it will happen in the near future in things like robotics, sensors as a service, immersive technology. We're already seeing that starting to occur in 3D printing. So this is the future where open source has its most power. So three lessons. One, if you're a startup, have no fear of the large corporate. They suck at situational awareness. This is why at Ubuntu, we were able to map out the environment in 2008, and by understanding the environment, tack the market and go from a small fraction of the market to 70% of cloud in 18 months. It's a company called Adalem. They started off with three people. Uh, they used mapping to focus on the stuff that mattered and ignore the stuff that didn't. They recently got bought by Microsoft for about 300 million. The second thing is the future. Yeah. Is awesome. <laughs> Except for surge pricing for funerals. The pioneers of open source have already moved into these spaces. You see it in terms of open hardware, in terms of what is going on with uh, open biology. And that's the third thing that's happening. Open source itself is changing. We have new people coming in, the new settlers. You can see this in the expo hall, where we had Diagon Alley and the Muggles. <laughs> Yes, the corporate monster has arrived, and we all want to be open. You can't toss a fruit up in the air without hitting an open cloud foundation or an open standards <laughs> initiative on the way down. But this is what success looks like. So we are moving from here to there. And why? Well, think of it as a symbolic change. Think of it as, we used to be the teenager, we've grown up. Um, this is the success that open sources brings. It is a new crowd, a new atmosphere, a new type of focus. Now, my last words, I just want to thank all the people who have got us here in the first place. In particular, all the chairs we've had of OSCON, all the conference organizers, all the people involved, and, um, of course, all of yourself. So please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you.